He has also taught medieval philosophy and history philosophy. He is the author of Reason and Value, Aristotle versus Rand, and editor of the Industrial Radical and co-editor of Anarchist Minarchism, is a government part of a free country, and the Journal of Ayn Rand Studies. He runs the Molinari Institute and Molinari Society, serves as a webmaster and archivist for the Alabama Philosophy, Philosophical Society, blogs at Austrian Athenian Empire and Bolivian Hard Libertarians. If you have to take a look at those blogs, please go there. It's a look. They're great. Serves as faculty advisor to the AU Libertarians and to the AU Young Americans for Liberty, and is a senior fellow at the Center for, the, for a Stateless Society, a senior scholar at the Ludwig von Mises Institute, and a co-founder of the Alliance of the Libertarian Left. So you are up for a treat, Professor Long.
have some commonalities, in particular, people on both sides are usually anti-war. There are exceptions on both sides because, you know, human is crazy, but um, by and large they agree on stuff like that. But they don't, even when they agree, they often disagree on what exactly the reasons are uh, for it. And uh, you know, radical leftists tend to be suspicious of libertarians, think that they are really you know, spokespersons for uh, the rich, for big business. And uh, you know, sometimes, you know, to some extent, I think that that is the leftist fault for not understanding libertarian theory. Sometimes I think it's libertarian's fault for uh, taking the wrong, having the sort of the wrong take and the wrong emphasis on libertarian theory. So I think there's there's blame to be shared on both sides of uh, this divide. Um, here's why they seem to be hostile. It looks, it looks as though each of these theories permits stuff that the other so that one wants to. So on the one hand, you know, libertarianism seems to permit, you know, there seems to be no limit to how much socioeconomic inequality the libertarianism will permit, as long as it comes about in the right way. That seems as though discrimination, exploitative workforces, and so forth, all of this um, is permissible. It's as though environmental damage and degradation is going to be fine for libertarians, as long as it's people doing stuff to their own property. So let's just look at what libertarianism allows, and I think, yeah. Then the libertarians that what the left is allowed, which is coercive interference with people's personal lives and their personal property and the products of their labor. And they think, yeah. So there's a mutual yeah. Not, you know, not a good basis for a first date. Uh, but back in the uh, 19th century, it was much more common to find views that you would have to describe as free market libertarian and as radical leftist. You have to describe and find views that uh, you'd have to describe as sharing both sets of concerns. Um, you know, so, the Alexander Schooner, Henry David Thoreau, uh, both really declare, and Benjamin Tucker, uh, uh, for uh, 19th century individual anarchists. Uh, so, it was at one time common for these views to go together. Uh, and that's because there are certain common roots here. So first, this is the equality of authority. Equality of authority means that I don't have any special rights over you. I don't have any special rights to tell you what to do. Um, you know, the, the notion of equality of authority you know, emerges as a prominent political force partly in response to the divine right of kings. According to the divine right of kings, some people are special. Some people have been picked up by God. And God says, this family has a right to rule all these other people. Um, but if you don't think that, if you think that uh, no one has any inherent right to tell anyone else what to do, well, this is a sort of a root of libertarian concerns. It's also a root of leftist concerns about, um, about various kinds of, of power that is not uh, strictly governmental power. And likewise, there's a certain concern with privilege. The two sides of the level define privilege the same way. But there's a certain concern that some people are getting special rights over other people, and there's something uh, damaging about that. Now, since the days of the 19th century, when these few views went together, they've more or less come apart uh, for various reasons, I think, because the rise of state socialism sort of drove the free market libertarians into an alliance of conservatives against state socialism, and uh, sort of created this kind of a, a wedge there. But, since then, libertarians have sort of specialized in understanding governmental, and in particularly directly governmental forms of uh, oppression. And radical leftists have sort of specialized in, in understanding and thinking about forms of oppression that aren't governmental, or at least aren't directly or obviously uh, governmental. Um, likewise, libertarians have sort of specialized in thinking about for profit solutions to these problems. And Radical leftists tend to specialize in thinking about non-profit solutions to these problems. Um, and I think that each side, you know, since they went their separate ways, each side has been doing some valuable work, but sort of in isolation from the insights of the other side, and <coughs> to learn from each other. Uh, yeah. So again, it's, it's, it's my claim is that free market libertarianism and radical leftism uh, are natural soulmates. They belong together. They've been driven apart by uh, evil circumstances but really, uh, free market libertarianism is the fullest natural development of radical leftism. And radical leftism is the fullest natural development of free market libertarianism. So, unhappy first date with this wonderful wedding at the end. So on the one hand, uh, if you value the ends that radical leftists value, you should have reason to care about libertarian means. Because 
because a lot of the evils that the radical left see themselves as combating, that they think are caused or exacerbated primarily by the free market, a proper libertarian analysis will, sh will show that those things tend to be caused mainly, not solely. The uh, you know, bringing in the state doesn't destroy all evil in the universe. We still have work to do after the revolution. But uh, you know, mainly uh, caused by the state. And uh, you know, it's the, the lack of understanding of economic analysis that has uh, caused uh, you know, the leftists not to realize this, although I think in many cases it's caused libertarians not to fully uh, appreciate it either. Uh, and on the other hand, if you care about libertarianism, you have some reason to care about radical leftist goals. Because the following view is would be an odd view. It's really, really bad to push people around in ways that involve force against person and property. But if you can manage to find some way to push people around or narrow their choices in ways that don't involve um, uh, you know, violating libertarian rights, then that's fine and dandy. I'm not saying this is logically inconsistent view. I think you could logically consistently say, well, you know, I'm against violating people's rights, but I'm in favor of, of uh, you know, pushing them around in any other possible way I can, but I'm short of that. That's a possible view, but it's just it's sort of weird. Because the best reason to be against uh, pushing people around is, uh, by force is that people matter, and their choices matter, and you know, you shouldn't treat people like crap. So uh, you know, I think that there's, you know, there's a pull in both directions. Uh, what has kept the, the, these two sides apart is that not only do uh, leftists assume, but I think many libertarians assume that many features of the existing economy, including you know, some of the vast socioeconomic inequality, the kind of corporate power we see, there are tendency to assume that that is largely the result of the free market, or that even if a society isn't part of the free market, it at least in many ways approximates to it. Uh, so that uh, if the you so that um, uh, if you really like free markets, then that sort of forces you to like. Uh, you know, the kind of stuff we have now. And if you don't like the kind of stuff we have now, that has to be to oppose free markets. And even people who sort of pay lip service to you know, the problems of crony capitalism, and I am pleased to see that that term has come into wide use the last couple of years, and that uh, problem has become more salient. Still, I think a lot of people think, well, crony capitalism is just a few articles on the, on the surface of what is essentially uh, a free market. To both sides not to make as great a distinction as they should between corporatism, which is essentially ruled by a partnership between big government and big business, not to see how different that is from a free market, or not to see the things that you might think are the products of free market are actually the products of corporatism. So there are, you know, there are two terms that I use. Uh, so conflationism is you know, failing to distinguish the products of the free market from the products of corporatism. It comes in two flavors. Well, left and right, I guess, aren't flavors. Um, they are directions, but it comes in two directions, so it's not right. Um, it comes in two flavors. So, left inflationism is a tendency to treat the evils of uh, you know, existing uh, capitalist society as showing the evils of the free market. And right inflationism is a tendency to take the virtues of the free market as a reason to defend various features of existing society that are actually the product of corporate 
doesn't mean that they're on the same page in every respect. Not, you know, it's certainly true that big government and big business have disagreements and quarrels as well. Each one would like to be the dominant partner, just like the church and state in the Middle Ages. So it's a, uh, you know, so when people think that big business and big government are opposed, they can find evidence that they really do fight. But it's fights between two factions of a, of a partnership where they still care more about So you see some kind of vast inequality. You think, well, either this is, you know, everyone else is totally incompetent except for the brilliant heroic entrepreneurs who run this outfit. And sometimes that's right, sure. You know, things can happen that way. But often you have reason to suspect that something is preventing people from fully uh, competing. Um, after all, the, you know, when you have these large hierarchical firms, you get something that's a little bit like uh, socialist planning. The more you have work into the firm, the less market feedback you have. And the harder it is for the people at the top to know what's really going on uh, you know, down on the floor. And so you know, there's reason to be skeptical when you see this large hierarchical firm. You think, well, some, you know, it doesn't seem that that efficient. It seems like something is, is protecting them from competition. Uh, the notion of class theory and class struggle doesn't come from Marx. Marx himself says, well, I got the idea from the bourgeois historians. Um, the difference is that Marx thought that it's this differential access to the means of production that determines what the ruling class is and what isn't. Whereas the, um, uh, with the libertarian, the classical liberal version of class theory says, well, where does this differential access to the means of production come from? Why are you know, these few people so wealthy and these other people you know, so not? Uh, it, did it just happen that way? Well, we see this in some kind of history of systematic expropriation and exploitation often carried on by means of Now, on this question you know, whether how large the hierarchical firms would get, there's an advantage to firms getting bigger because economies of scale, it's, you, know, the, you can you, know, you can do things more efficiently if you uh, if you, you know, it's it's easier to do uh, you know, for two firms to merge and become one firm because they don't have to you know, have double for everything. Um, Tax paid subsidies for highways. 
health insurance companies and various things at the expense and uh, the medical establishment at the, at the expense of individual people. But like I mean, what do you call a government mandate that everybody has to buy insurance? I mean, it's corporate welfare for insurance companies. Uh, and also, if you look at um, starting to see some union movement that's bypassing all this stuff. Union movement that's bypassing uh, government privileges, so-called free unions, that I think actually just you know, make labor a, a junior partner of, uh, of uh, uh, the big business, big government uh, partnership. We're starting to see more independent uh, unionism. I think that that's something that libertarians should celebrate.
and we should be able to find that more free countries have a smaller size business on average than less free ones then? Is there any evidence of that? I mean, the effect might not be linear either. This is an interesting empirical relationship that, that could come out of it. But uh, I'm not inclined to think that society will look radically different in terms of the shape and size of its businesses until I get some evidence using the existing data. By the way, if you don't have a good reference, for someone sitting in this room here who's an aspiring economist, that could be a dissertation for you if you're into a speculative. <laughs> I'm not sure that we should expect that societies with more economic freedom now uh, would be likely to have uh, uh, have uh, smaller firms set now because uh, the, yeah. there are multiple factors at work, and given that the that countries that liberalize economically tend to have a certain conception in mind of what it means to liberalize economically, in particular something like imitating the successful Western countries, uh, countries that liberalize economically tend to do it in a way that is. Um, that is heavily corporate, uh, so that you get increases of freedom uh, you know, in freedom, but you get them in a way that carries corporatism along with it. Whereas very poor company, very poor countries don't um, uh, might not have terribly large firms just because they can't afford to have very large anything. I mean, they don't have very large militaries either. I mean, that's not because having a large military is you know is indicative of a free market. Uh, it just might be something that a free market makes possible. I mean, really poor countries don't really have very big governments. They have very bad governments. So there's a sense in which they don't have really big, powerful governments. Because uh, a, an unhealthy, uh, you know, if, if the parasite is too harmful to the host, the host is too unhealthy to support very robust parasites. Whereas, you know, the more, you know, so that's why the most liberal countries on Earth often have incredibly inclusive governments, both at home and abroad, just because it makes that possible. So I would, I would not expect, um, uh, I wouldn't expect uh, the more free countries in today's world necessarily to have uh, less corporatism. Um, but then it is an interesting question, all right, so what kinds of economic, uh, empirical correlations should we look for? And you know, I don't have a good answer to that question, but I think, you know, and like you say, if there's a dissertation topic for you, figure out you know, what would be uh, like the empirical correlations. But what I said, I do think that when you see, when you have you know, when you have massive roadblocks in front of something that many that many many people would really like to do, like just you know, starting you know, serving food in their kitchen and, and uh, charging people without having to get you know, a million licenses and so forth. So there's something that would get people money and it would be really easy for them to do and they really like to do it. And then there's a huge mountain in the way. It doesn't seem unreasonable to think get rid of the mountain and you see a big rush. So a uh, point that I'm more familiar with that I know that left libertarians tend to make quite well, quite eloquently, as you've done, is to point out the ways in which sort of the modern corporatist economy uh, sort of uh, encourages these business models, right? But uh, would you be able to say a little bit about maybe like even to the extent that they do result from free interactions, they might still be uh, something we ought to oppose for other reasons? Yeah, so I think that the, um, the kinds of things that we think uh, left libertarians think would be more likely under a free market are also the kinds of things that we tend to think are, are better anyway, just sort of more humane ways to treat people. And that goes back to the point that I made that, um, that if you're against, um, you know, if you're against governmental or coercive ways of pushing people around, that gives you some reason to be against other ways of pushing people around, even if those ways are not against the violent rights, and therefore not ways that should be combated by force. Um, nevertheless, the kind of, of uh, bureaucratic micromanaging attitude that you get in, in, in uh, large companies, um, and many small companies for that matter, um, is one that's bad for many of the same reasons that is bad when the government does it. And so, although we have reason to think that there'd be a lot less of that 
just to bring it back to the earlier topic of um, which types of, like if we could analyze different countries and look at their economies and then say, oh, you know, this one is fostering this kind of model, this one's fostering this kind of model, and thus we can deduce this. We know that that's not how the current world is set up. The economy seems to be fully globalized, all the economies are for the most part tied together, the U.S. is at the top of that pile for the most part, and the U.S.'s policies in money and currency and World Bank and IMF and Bretton Woods, I mean, all these types of things affect all of these other countries as well. So it seems very unlikely that we could look at some, you know, third world country and deduce something from analyzing it as if it's another one. Yeah, that's true. interesting differences. I mean, recently there's a lot of attention to paid to the fact that in some ways, countries like Canada and Denmark, that the return topic would think of as such socialist horrible places, in some ways are more free market than the U.S. If you're talking not about the extent taken in taxes, because they tend to have higher taxes and bigger welfare states, but in terms of the 